I guess we better preach here and, uh, and get this in you know. Trust but verify. The ministry of discernment. How many of you have ever trusted somebody and they were untrustworthy and they let you down? Let me see your hands that have, okay. You, a few of you that didn't raise your hand, you just didn't feel like raising your hand, right? I think everybody has had one time or another when we got sucked into something because we didn't take the time to check it out. When I first came here as a pastor, had a lovely lady here, and uh, she had just been deceived by a guy who attended an Assembly God church. He was a financial planner. Few of you know who he is. And uh, he had ripped her off for like $400,000. That's a big hit, right? And I'll never forget sitting down with her and she said, but he's such a honest face and he's a believer and he goes to this church and 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 and, and went on and on trust and verifier ronald reagan is attributed to that saying and it's easier said than done because when we ask the questions, do the fact checking, oftentimes we are perceived as, what, you don't trust me? Now that's a red flag when they do that, right, amen? So this text this morning is kind of cool. I'm gonna read down through the text. The main portion that I wanna really teach on starts at verse 10, but to set it up, we'll go through, this is Paul and Silas, they're on their first missionary journey pretty interesting the things, the insights that we see from this passage regarding discernment. Verse one, Acts chapter 17. Now when they had passed through Amphiphilus and Apollina, they came to Thessalonica where there was no, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. As Paul's custom, uh, he went to the Jew first and then the Gentile all through his ministry. He was the apostle to the Gentiles, but he also never forgot his brothers, the Jews. Verse 2, Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scripture. Verse 3, Explaining and demonstrating that the Christ, that's the Messiah, had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach, he is the Messiah. So we see from verse three that he reasoned. It's a Greek word that means to lay forth. I remember that you can remember the Greek word because it's, uh, it's like the word lego, legos. Legos, you're laying them side by side. Paul put everything in order. He reasoned with them, but notice verse three, explained and demonstrated. It's one thing to explain something, it's another thing to demonstrate it. How did Paul demonstrate it? He demonstrated it with his life. How do you and I back up what, is it, what it is that we say? I think the biggest problem in being a parent, as I remember, was being able to live up what I said. I said, you know, do what I say, don't do what I do. You know, so if you're preaching to your kids or modeling to them or trying to model to them something that you preach but you don't do it, it doesn't make any sense. The same thing with the gospel. If you're going to preach the gospel, then you should live the gospel. Amen. Verse four, and some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks. And not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. Now notice in verse 4, it was the devout Greeks, not the Jews, who responded to the message. So he's there for three weeks, three Sabbaths. He's preaching in the synagogue and other places. But it's the Greeks who respond. And we see in verse 5, But the Jews who were not persuaded, 
becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason. Now, in today's, if that happened today, they wouldn't go to the house and just put something on the internet or Facebook and had the same reaction. But they didn't have all of that. So in this particular case, they actually went to his house. But they didn't find Paul and Silas, look at verse six. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren uh, to the rulers of the city. Now this is great. <laughs> so the person they're looking for, they can't find, but they dragged somebody anyway. It's possible that Jason's house became the focal point of, of the Thessalonican church, uh, and they may have been meeting there already. So. Here's what happens in verse 6, and I have a highlighted and underlined. I want to comment on a couple of things regarding it. So crying out, they said, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Now think about that. Wouldn't you love that to be said about you or the church today? Unfortunately, the church today is in a major crisis. I don't know if you've noticed or not. Here's from uh, a new book. There's two or three that are just hitting the shelves right now. We're currently experiencing the largest and fastest religious shift in U.S. history. Now, as I've hung out with the church and some of you, there, Pastor Mike, there's a great revival coming. You listen to Christian television. There's a great revival coming. It's blowing up in name the city. You know. Now I'm of the other camp. I believe the scripture teaches there's going to be a great falling away before the Lord comes. Oh, we might have pockets of revival. But there's a great falling away. So this author says we're in the largest and fastest religious shift in U.S. history. It is greater than the first and second great awakenings and every revival in our country combined except it's in the opposite direction. Opposite direction. And in their book, which is the result of about three to four years of research, they have found that 40 million believers have become de-churched, 40 million. They're not from the builder generation or the boomer generation. They're mostly from the generations behind those. They're our kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids. They found some fascinating things. 25% of them haven't lost their faith, still believe in orthodox theology, but are just fed up with church and don't attend. 40 million. So in this great shift, in contrast, here we have these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Is it too late to turn the world upside down? Well, I can't turn the world upside down. I may be able to turn my manor or my neighborhood upside down, right? I think that's maybe where we start at. I don't know. Verse 7, Jason has harbored them and these all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Isn't it interesting that Paul was preaching about the Messiah. Here they shifted to just King Jesus, not the Mashiach of Israel. Verse 8, And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city. And when they heard these things, so, verse 9, When they had taken security, that means they took a, they demanded money. So Jason and the believers had to come up with money. We're going to put you in jail or whatever. 
And they set them free and let them go. Verse 10, this is the meat of what I want to talk about. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews, similar to Thessalonica. Verse 11, these were more fair-minded. I love the King James better for this trend. They were noble-minded. New King James is fair-minded. Then those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well. So there was a revival here in Berea. If you look on your handout for a moment, letter A, receiving, not being deceived. Receiving, not being deceived. I want to receive God's truth, but I don't want to be deceived. Number one, they were more noble. In the King James, it means they were not prejudiced against what they were going to hear. In other words, people in the political realm say, I have an open mind. Nobody's got an open mind in politics. <laughs> Everybody's got their mind made up. I have yet to find somebody with an open mind, except for me. <laughs> uh, uh. They received the word, number two. So why did they receive the word? Do you have these three things? And I want to dwell on these three things. They're all found in verse 11. They received the word with readiness. They searched daily. I love this. Number one, readiness of mind readiness of my or, or literally eager of mind this means that they were eager for the truth i think the problem of growing older is that we think we've already had all the truth there's no more truth so i open up my bible and i go to a passage i've read a hundred times i'm preaching through acts but in my regular reading i'm reading the book of acts Sometimes I'm tempted to skip things that I've read or really know. That's when I know that there's going to be something there for me, invariably. It's wonderful if I have an open and ready mind to receive what is there. Eager to learn. Never get so old or decrepit or whatever that we're not eager to hear from God. Number two, they searched the word. Politically speaking today, that's fact-checking, fact right? Everybody's obsessed with fact-checking. <laughs> Before they received anything, they check it out. They make sure that what is being preached or said is really in God's word. Now remember, they didn't have the New Testament. What were they checking? They were checking Isaiah. They were checking the prophets. They were checking the Old Testament. They were going through whatever Paul preached, and much of what he preached, he quoted from the Old Testament. They went back and they verified what it was they were being told. And number three, daily in the word. This has two meanings in this passage. They kept looking every day until they found the answer. And number two, they developed a daily habit. So there's many things I have. I keep, I keep a couple of different journals. I have the unanswered journal. That's where I have questions that have yet to be answered. Well, better, I haven't found the answer. Somebody may have found the answer. I've not found the answer. And I get bits and pieces and nuggets of information come from all kinds of, and I, I jot them down in, in that journal. There's some theological issues, personal issues, other kinds of things. I just don't have the answer for that. 
but because I journal it, my mind is ready to receive when it shows up. So I have that journal at home, it's a big one, then I carry a small little pocket journal with me where I'm driving around somewhere and a thought comes to me. I can dictate it onto my phone, but you know, the phone is, what do I want to say about the phone? It, the analog writing on a piece of paper, it has power in that. And I can find it on the page easier than I can find it in my phone. <laughs> oh, man. So jotting these things down in such a way that daily I, my mind is ready to receive. Daily I'm verifying the Word of God. And then daily I'm reading His Word. Those three things will help you to develop a spirit of discernment. Now there's a spiritual gift of discernment, but I'm just call, I'm just saying natural discernment. Trust, but verify, as Reagan said, from a biblical sense, I need to be like the Bereans who were more noble-minded, who were more open to receive the truth and went through the process to make sure that it was true. Verse 12, letter B on your handout, walking in the word, and the last one will be walking with the word. This, this first group of people became the believers of Berea in Thessalonica. Here Paul writes to them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 to 8, and I've got it bolded and highlighted. I want to read that to you. And you became followers of us, and of the Lord. Paul was not ashamed to say, hey, follow me because I'm following the Lord. I'm modeling for you what good behavior looks like, what good theology looks like. Verse 6, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all of Macedonia and Acacia, who believe. For from you the word of the Lord was sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Acacia, but every place. These people who took the time to search God's word, to receive it in truth, to fact check it, to walk in it daily, they became an example of what it means to be a believer who is the light of the world. Letter C, walking with the word, verse 13. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul in Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds, and immediately the brethren sent Paul away. Now I love this, Paul's being sent away all the time. But he's not running away. He's being led by the Holy Spirit. In the Marine Corps, Chesty Puller, famous uh, colonel in what is known as the Frozen Chosen of Korea, he borrowed a slogan from a Civil War Union general. Maybe you've heard this before. Somebody came up and told Chesty, we're all surrounded, what are we going to do? He said, uh, we're going to advance to the rear. The guy said, you mean we're going to retreat? He said, I didn't say we're going to retreat. I said, we're going to advance to the rear. Listen up. Sometimes you need to change course and advance to the rear. Doesn't mean you're giving up. You're going in a different direction. Under the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit. How many of you may need to advance to the rear today? Yeah, well, I got a few hands on that one. I want to end with John 16, 33 at the bottom of your handout on the left. Jesus, at the end of his ministry, speaking to the disciples, at the end of what's called the Upper Room Discourse, uh, they were going to be thrown into the mix of the advance of the kingdom of God. 
And he says this to them, and he says it to us. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Let that sink in. I think the only real peace is in Jesus. I'm so encouraged by Jim Graham's Facebook posts and his poems. Uh, he's a prolific poem writer. And at the heart of much of his poetic writing is this thought. In Jesus is real peace. Oh, I get temporary peace when the pain stops. I get temporary peace when a joyful event takes place. But real peace that lasts through both the joy and both the disappointment of life is found in Jesus Christ. If I've not learned to trust in that peace, I'll never really have true peace. Jesus goes on to say, in the world you will have tribulation. <laughs> uh, why did it have to be that way? Why couldn't it be the kingdom of God came, Jesus came, rose from the dead, the Holy Spirit came, and we never had a problem after that. Yeah. That'd be great. That was because of the, his plan's not done yet. He's coming back. He's coming back. Ba, 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 ba. He's a coming back. He's coming back because his kingdom is yet future. It's present, but it's yet future. A new heaven and a new earth. If you like this earth, you're going to like the next earth. Even better, he's coming back. Who would say amen to that? Amen. You know, I'd be happy with that today. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And if Jesus has overcome the world, and I find my peace in him, I also can overcome the world. Trust but verify, let the discernment of the Holy Spirit rise up in your life. Don't believe what everybody says. Remember, I don't believe that anybody says. Make sure it's the Word of God. Let it get down in your soul and into your spirit. Amen? Amen. Lord, help us today. To walk with you in truth and peace and power. We're in an age, Lord, where there are many that are leaving the church, many that are leaving the faith. You said we are the light of the world. And that light is to be put on the top of the hill, not hidden away. Lord, there's so many times I feel like running under the table when you've said, Lord, 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 into my heart. Let your light shine. Don't be afraid to live out the word of God. Like these early believers affected the whole area of Asia because they walked in the light they weren't afraid of the darkness they took the time to discern truth from error let us walk in the power of your truth today Lord I pray for everyone here in the room that you would encourage us to be hungry for the word of God let a new hunger rise up in our hearts let us read your word. Let us live in it, drink from it, eat from it. Let us be immersed 
in your wonderful word. Let us be immersed in your presence as you speak through the Holy Spirit to us. Let us rise up in your joy and your power. Bless these people, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said what? Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Amen.